Hello, I'm Mark Doherty. Uh, welcome to our town hall on COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, I have, there's three of us here that will be discussing this uh, complicated situation. I'm the uh, hospital epidemiologist at Baptist Lexington and an infectious disease doctor. My partner, Dr. Rodriguez, is also an infectious disease doctor. And we have also here Agatha Krish, Critchfield. Mm -hmm. uh, she's in maternal fetal medicine here at Baptist Lexington. First off, uh, as an overview, uh, as most people know, we have two vaccines available right now. And those are the messenger RNA vaccines from Pfizer and from Moderna. Uh, on the horizon, we have another vaccine from Johnson & Johnson or uh, Janssen uh, that's an adenovirus vector vaccine. So the two main uh, types of vaccines that are now uh, going to be available will be the messenger RNA and adenovirus vector. Uh, there are other vaccines coming down the pike. Um, uh, CureVac has a protein-based uh, vaccine and there's some other models that, are, that will be also used. Uh, one of the things that has been really uh, incredible is the striking uh, efficiency of the vaccines. They've been very effective in terms of preventing uh, severe uh, COVID-19 that results in hospitalization or death. One of the things that we've noticed from the trials is that as time goes on, uh, people develop more immunity. So early on after a vaccine is given, uh, you develop I, uh, IgG levels, antibody levels that confer some portion of immunity. And then after that, we have the T cell arm of the immune system kick in. So that we've seen uh, in the clinical trials with Pfizer, Moderna, and with uh, Johnson & Johnson, that after the uh, uh, five to seven weeks after the first vaccine has been given, that there were no hospitalizations and no mortality from COVID-19, which is an incredible feat. Uh, there's been some controversy about the effectiveness of one of the vaccines versus uh, other vaccines. Pfizer and Moderna uh, seem to be incredibly uh, effective in, in their trials. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson, at least on the surface, look like that, that it might not be quite as effective. It's a one-dose vaccine, and they are trialing it at two doses. But So basically, we're comparing a one-dose vaccine to a two-dose vaccine. Uh, when you uh, delve a little bit deeper, uh, 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 is not exactly comparing apples to apples because the uh, studies were done in different time periods. The studies on the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine uh, were done when we didn't have a lot of viral variants circulating uh, that are both more contagious and maybe uh, more virulent, uh, particularly the, uh, the variants out of uh, Brazil, the UK, and South Africa. Uh, at least with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, a lot of the patients enrolled in the study were from Brazil and South Africa. And uh, we have seen uh, that uh, even with those variants, we had no uh, mortality and no hospitalizations after day 49, which is really incredible with the one dose vaccine. Uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, uh, at least in the lab, look like that they're uh, going to be a, uh, effective against those viral variants, not as effective against the original Wuhan type strains, but uh, still effective. Uh, so that is one thing that we're going to have to be dealing with down the road, whether we'll need uh, boosters for these vaccines. Uh, uh, it's looking like we, we probably will at uh, some point. In terms of uh, side effects from the vaccines, uh, one of the things that uh, I think uh, one big issue that was raised when it started getting, uh, they started first getting administered in the UK was anaphylaxis because they did have several people uh, develop anaphylaxis. Uh, that usually happens very shortly after administration of the vaccine. And that's why everyone has to be observed for 15 minutes at least after the vaccine is administered. I just checked into our experience in terms of those uh, uh, more serious type side effects. Uh, we've given a total of 9,000 doses of vaccine here at Baptist Lexington. We've had four patients that developed serious uh, enough side effects to go to the emergency room, one that was admitted. Uh, so that's a fairly low incidence. The other three did, did fine. Uh, in terms of other side effects, most of those seem to occur more often after the second dose of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Uh, and it's fairly common for people to get fevers, chills, uh, fatigue that lasts for 24 to 40 hours. And then most people are completely better after that. Uh, one, as an aside, uh, there's a general recommendation to not take anything prophylactically for that. 
Uh, I would especially steer away from the non-asteroidal uh, anti-inflammatory medications. There's at least some theoretical concerns that if you take those that might blunt your response to the, your immune response to the vaccine and you might not be as effective. It might not be as effective. Now, uh, uh, acetaminophen uh, might, if you're going to take something that would probably be better than a non-steroidal. Uh, I'm going to now uh, hand it over to uh, Dr. Rodriguez and he will be uh, uh, addressing some common questions that are asked about the vaccines. All right, thanks, Mark. Now, here we are about a year into the outbreak. And if you're looking at numbers, we still have 26 million or so cases in the United States, over 400,000 deaths. It's still an ongoing issue. Very beginning of the outbreak, there were no cases here. We had a few cases in, in Washington. We were wondering what was gonna happen, but clearly it, it continues to, uh, to grow and it is continuing to change. So as we go along, our understanding of the virus has improved. Our understanding of immunity has improved. And all along, we have been evaluating treatments. You know, we have some more standardized treatments. We think we have made an impact on those patients that get sick, but still we have patients getting sick that have a lot of risk factors, your diabetics, your obese patients, et cetera. And they are continuing to succumb to the virus. That includes uh, patients in Kentucky. So clearly while we're looking at therapeutics and continue to look at them and we have ongoing trials looking at different treatments, there has always been a focus all along about trying to develop some preventative ways to combat this outbreak. The origin of, of these vaccines is not just de novo, just popped up the last couple of months. The trials have been now publicized, but really a lot of this stems back to many years ago when we had SARS, MERS, some of those earlier severe coronavirus outbreaks where they were taking some of that information, looking at uh, vaccines and carrying it forward. So we, in some respects, had a, a running start to dealing with this current outbreak. So it's not done in a vacuum. Sometimes people say we're just rushing and trying to uh, pu uh, push through uh, vaccinations to get a product out there. That's not the way this works. We know this is a significant illness. They actually are taking studies that were done previously, continuing to look at animal models, looking at uh, different phases. Remember that most of these therapeutics go through different phases of tr uh, trials, going from the animal, going from the bench side, all the way to our vaccine trials phase three, where we have some emergency approvals for the Moderna and the Pfizer and upcoming probably the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So remember, this is not occurring in a vacuum. There's a long history that attaches to these vaccines. And vaccines, if you wanna go back even farther, I mean, you can go back into the, uh, way back into India and China, and the practice of vaccination is probably between vaccination and sanitation, the two most important factors in controlling and preventing infectious diseases in, in the history of the world. So we have concepts that we take and move forward. How do we choose what to, what to look at in these vaccines? It again is done by careful study. When you look at the anatomy of, a vac, of the virus itself, we know that there are different components to that virus. And you might've seen why they call it a coronavirus because cir circling the virus particle itself, it looks like a little crown where you have those spike proteins, but it has other little proteins within that virus. And they specifically looked at every part of that virus and developing antibodies for vaccine candidates to see, does it protect you? So you might take another part of that virus, develop an antibody, go in and see whether that uh, protects you or not and found out, no. For example, a, a antibody to the nucleocapsid protein did not really provide protection. Eventually they had settled on the spike protein, which is the important part of that virus that attaches to that ACE2 inhibitor that's part of your cells and that if you develop an antibody response to that uh, spike protein, you have some protection. Awesome, so we have the concept, we develop now how to deliver and how to get, how to almost not trick, but how to get your body to respond to that protein to develop an immune response. Normally, if you get sick with the virus, that's what your body does. Your body sees that spike protein, they develop an antibody response, 
uh, that is coordinated between different types of your immune cells, the B cells, which produce antibodies, and the T cells, which help direct the B cells. Combined together, they provide you some protection against uh, infection. And what we did with a vaccine is, take, is try to take part of that protein that elicits that response, the spike protein, and figure out how to trick your body into developing those antibodies. So what we have uh, developed in these most recent vaccines that have been um, approved is to use the genetic uh, code that codes for that part of the spike protein. Put it into your body in a localized injection. Your body uh, translates that into the part of the spike protein and your body recognizes, it doesn't know whether it's an infection or not. It just sees, it just sees that spike protein and it says, it's not part of my normal body develops antibodies, develops the immune response, and then you have the protection. The studies that were recently published uh, in, in uh, Lancet New England Journal looked at thousands of patients. We're talking of each, each one of them had to close to 40 to 30,000 participants in a study and they randomized, they say, this group of people are gonna get the vaccine, this group of people are gonna get sugar water, you know, what we always call sugar water, placebo and then try to follow to see who develops significant clinical disease. And based on that information, they have found that there was a significant protection, uh, protective effect of being vaccinated. They say 95% uh, effectiveness for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, 72% or so maybe for the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. There are differences in how the trials are done, the time periods that were done, but the important message is that in all these vaccines to date, Nobody has really become seriously ill and ended up in the ICU on a ventilator from COVID. So it has a protective effect, which is awesome. So we have vaccines now that have some emergency approval, the two vaccines, uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna. I've received the Pfizer vaccine, the two doses. There are slight differences between the two. The Pfizer vaccine is three weeks apart in terms of the first and second dose. The Moderna was four weeks apart. The Johnson & Johnson, which is still awaiting emergency approval, is a one-dose vaccine. I got a little bit fatigued, a little bit of a sore arm when I got uh, my, my vaccine. My wife, who got the Moderna vaccine, got a little more ill, got a little more fatigued, had a fever probably of about 100, did not feel good for about a day, and then it, it resolved. So that's great. Now we're in the phase of trying to roll out the vaccines and it's a massive project. I mean, to date we have 20 some odd million people vaccinated, but in terms of people completing two doses in the US, still only about 6 million people have had the two dose series. And obviously the goal is, as President Biden was talking about is to try to get 100 million doses in 100 days. There's a massive effort underway trying to do this, uh, employing local health facilities, public health, uh, potentially even the military, trying to figure out Kroger's, whoever can participate in this effort is being enrolled. There's a, it is not being done uh, again in a vacuum where you get a shot and you're going. We're trying to be systematic about vaccinating and then monitoring you for side effects and, and being part of a, a larger system of information gathering to make sure that the vaccine is safe and to make sure that we uh, continue to deliver good health care uh, to uh, patients uh, and those that get vaccinated. So now we have the questions. Now I, I gave you that background because if you go on the internet, it is really sometimes hard to discern truth. Everybody has a very strong opinion and this is being done in the, in the setting of people being afraid of vaccinations, the history of vaccinations, uh, and a lot of misinformation that's being on the internet and uh, the, the truth. And sometimes what you read on the internet and what you hear is a partial kernel of truth, which still makes it difficult to, to, to discern. So going through these uh, questions, what are the, uh, what are, I'll, I'll read them as they come along here. If you get um, Anaphylaxis, for example, is one of the big concerns and major side effects to the vaccine. One of the major side of people don't want to get sick. That is being monitored. The, the number of cases in the U.S. initially were around, reported at, uh, on the MMWR was 11 anaphylaxis cases out of over a million some odd cases. So 
it's still a relatively uncommon phenomenon. If you have a history of anaphylaxis to a, to a vaccination, you are still considered to be eligible to get the vaccine. The difference is if you have no history at all, we monitor you for 15 minutes. If you have a history of anaphylaxis in the past, we monitor you for a longer period of time, namely 30 minutes. In the vaccine itself, the, uh, at least the two approved vaccines currently, there are no egg products, there's no latex. The one component that people think might, might have an allergic uh, reaction to is the polyethylene glycol because the technology in terms of encapsulating that mRNA uses polyethylene glycol. But essentially the, the, the anaphylaxis rate is still extremely low. It's being uh, monitored and there's no contraindication if you have previously had a vac uh, an anaphylactic reaction. Same for uh, Guillain-Barre, because another thing that people worry about is Guillain-Barre. Remember back in uh, the 70s, you had Guillain-Barre associated with uh, flu vaccination. And there was a concern that that was going to be an issue. If you've had a history of Guillain-Barre, that is not a contraindication. There are no increases in Guillain-Barre uh, for, for any of these vaccinations to date, but they're being monitored because it is a new vaccine. And that, that's, that by the way, goes for most vaccinations. Everything, we, you're always looking for a signal to see whether or not there's an adverse reaction. So anaphylaxis, you're still eligible to have it. If you have had Guillain-Barre before, you're still eligible to have it. Uh, Another question came up in terms of side effects. What about seizures? If you have a seizure history, are you, is that a contraindication? The answer is no. There, there have not been an increased uh, signal for seizures when you receive the vaccination. If you look at the epilepsy associations, they also put out their recommendations saying there is no contraindication to, to taking the vaccine. So I would, I would urge you that with each of these red flags that you're raising in terms of your concerns for side effects, that you try to also go to your specific illness organization. So epilepsy.org or you know, rightfootarthritis.org, whatever your association might be, because a lot of them are trying to gather the information and, and put that out there for their constituents. Uh, th so that was one of the questions. P uh, patient had, had epilepsy, there's no contraindication. What about, wh uh, why does the, a person who gets the second shot have a little more uh, side effects than the first shot? Mark, you want to answer that? Why do they or do they? Or No, why do they? Do well, we know why? <laughs> I think that's uh, because they're responding more vigorously to uh, the challenge. So you've had some element of immunity already from the first uh, dose and your body's reacting more vigorously because it's seeing something that recognizes the immune system's are already been primed. And uh, we think that that's, uh, that's the issue. Um, fortunately, most of those are very transient and uh, not long lasting. Uh, someone had, in terms of side effects of vaccines, someone had asked a question about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We, we were one of the study centers for that along with UK and Norton's. And, um, we're actually the largest site in the world for the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, it's our impression that it has fewer uh, potential side effects. We didn't see any anaphylaxis. Uh, we did see some people that got sore arms and, and uh, transient fevers, uh, but overall uh, the, uh, the reaction rate seemed to be much lower. But again, remember that's a, right now it's a one dose vaccine. And so uh, we weren't giving second doses. It may be that if we end up needing to give a second dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that we'll see more uh, vigorous reactions with the second dose. Uh, we're in the process of doing a trial, looking at doing a second dose of the Johnson & Johnson. But remember, uh, that's, a, that's still a new vaccine. I mean, the Moderna, and, the, and right now we're talking about 26 million doses of Pfizer and Moderna. So that's, you're, you're rapidly expanding these numbers of people that are getting vaccinations. So the data really becomes more, more robust when you start with initial trials or smaller. And then as we expose a ton more millions of people, we're gonna have more information saying, uh, this is what you're gonna see. Remember the majority of side effects at this point are, are considered mild to moderate, local site, uh, site uh, injection site tenderness and uh, maybe a low grade fever. That's the vast majority, fatigue, it is not uh, severe. Severe uh, cases still in terms of side effects are probably less than 2%, less than 1%, not a lot, but you, you're gonna continue to gather that information. 
Oh, well, let me mention one more thing. Go. So uh, the uh, vaccines are primarily designed uh, to prevent uh, severe infection uh, resulting in hospitalization and death. Uh, we know, we hope that they reduce uh, the, uh, the rate of infection uh, for the person that's vaccinated, but uh, we know that some people who have been vaccinated will still get infected with just milder symptoms. So just because someone's been uh, vaccinated, that doesn't mean that they can't become infected and potentially spread it to others. Uh, we hope that the viral burden in the, in the uh, person who's vaccinated will be lower and more transient, that, that it won't uh, last as long. Uh, so we hope that they'll be uh, less contagious, but we really don't know the answer to that yet. So just because you've had a vaccine doesn't mean that you can't potentially get infected, have minimal symptoms, but then pass it to someone else. And that's an important, here's another on the internet, because I, uh, I, I have, I, my, my family sends me stuff all the time about what about this and what about that and what about this. So they sent me something and there's a, it's on the internet and says, and, and they're ridiculing the whole concept of even having a vaccination that you can't prove prevents the disease. Well, first of all, this, these are still ongoing trials. So a lot of that data was collected and it will be reported on later on. In other words, the vaccine trials also collected PCR samples of uh, patients at different intervals, uh, serologic uh, data on to see whether they developed uh, signs or uh, some kind of signal that they actually got infected. And that data is not reported on. But at least we know for a fact at this point that severe disease, which is important because what, what are we talking about with severe disease? If you get on a ventilator in an ICU from COVID, your mortality is quite high even with all the treatments that we have. So that is really an, an end goal for doing this. And while the majority of people that get that ill usually have a lot of co uh, risk factors, including age and their co comorbidities, that's still an important feature. That is what swamped a lot of hospitals, took up ventilators, took up ICU beds. Uh, and so it's still an important part. It's, it shouldn't be ridiculed that it was not completely, you know, uh, they don't have that data yet. Uh, now, what about uh, patients that are out there that are taking biologic agents? So, for example, if you're on uh, high-dose steroids, you're on treatments, and there's a whole, there's a whole group of patients that that, that can encompass. Cancer patients, uh, rheumatologic patients, uh, patients uh, who are just on high-dose steroids for other reasons. There are no data to give you a, a definitive answer. That is something that is be beyond, that, that beyond any of the trial data. The trials didn't go out and recruit severely immunocompromised patients to have the vaccines. However, they are studying patients now. This, the first uh, studies are to look at patients within certain criteria, including comorbidities. So they didn't avoid sick people. They just, we just know from previous data and from previous vaccine trials if you have high dose steroids, you're on chemo, you're on some other you're bone marrow transplant patient, you're less likely to respond to a vaccine. That does not mean that you don't receive vaccination. It just means you have to go into there with, in conversation with your physician that your response may be less than a person that has no underlying illness, no immunosuppression. That being said, if you're severely immunocompromised, we tend to have some caveats. We generally avoid live virus vaccines, but the current vaccines that are approved, the, M, uh, the mRNA vaccines are not live virus at all. You're, not, you're, you're injecting a piece of a genetic code to, to make your body make that spike protein. So it is not contraindicated from that standpoint, but you may have less of a response. Well, and it, it, uh, if, you discuss, if you're in that category, I would recommend discussing that with your doctor and considering the possibility of uh, missing a dose of your uh, alpha TNF inhibitor if you have rheumatoid arthritis or, or Crohn's disease, if they think that that would be a reasonable thing to do because it, it, perhaps some of the immunosuppression could be held briefly to give you a chance to respond to the vaccine. Now, we had patients that got, and we've already seen this locally, you got your first dose of vaccine. Then you actually got COVID. Usually, again, none of those patients got severely sick, but they got a mild case of COVID. What do you do? That's not, that was not written in a book and still is not written in a book exactly what to do with that kind of a case. And we've had to think through it based on the available evidence in terms of what to do. So one, 
you know, if you want to always go back to some of these sources, you can go back to cdc.gov. They have a whole COVID section that, that discusses vaccinations, or you can go to your own uh, organization, whether it's the American College of Obstetricians or, you know, the American uh, College of Surgeons or something to see what they are saying specifically to your, to your case. But if you look at cdc.gov, which uh, encompasses the ACIP, which is the general organization that looks at vaccine recommendations. Currently, the recommendation is if you received a vaccination and you're waiting on your second dose, you're in between, and you get sick, in general, the recommendations are get over your illness and make sure you're out of isolation and then consider your, your second dose of vaccination. And we have kind of used other information to say potentially you could extend that period to three months because there are very few cases of people getting a recurrent infection after, um, after three months. So you probably have a, at least a three month window in which to schedule your vaccination. What about if you get your first dose and you missed your appointment for your second dose, when should you get it? Do you have to start the vaccine series over again? The answer is no just get it as soon as you can in terms of rescheduling it and then move forward. Um, let's see, blah, 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 blah. What time are we? Okay. I think that'll, I think that'll cover some. Now, another big area, <laughs> she's getting ready, <laughs> of uh, concern over, especially on the internet is vaccinations and fertility and pregnancy. Big issue, again, we have a lot of healthcare workers that are uh, nurses that want to get pregnant. They're at, the, they're at the childbearing age and they're all worried about getting a vaccination. And remember the, the whole vaccine strategy in terms of overarching is one, we want to decrease death and disease. And two, we want to keep the country moving and includes the healthcare system. So that, that's why we prioritize healthcare workers in terms of getting vaccinated and vaccinating our vulnerable uh, populations, including nursing homes, for example. So Dr. Critchfield was gonna touch base on some of the fertility issues and pregnancy, et cetera. Yeah. Take it away. Thanks. So um, yeah, I'm one of the maternal fetal medicine physicians or high-risk obstetricians here. And um, I'm glad to talk about this issue you might have to cut me off because this is, we spend so much time thinking about this, but um, I think what we can start with, and I'll try to sort of keep this brief, is what we, what we don't know or where the holes are, and then what we do know so that how we're helping patients who are pregnant or want to get pregnant or are breastfeeding to make relatively informed decisions. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking about Moderna and Pfizer and those two vaccines. And like many vaccine trials or many clinical trials in general, pregnant patients were not actively recruited or included in the trial. And that is a whole lecture unto itself or a hotly debated topic. But so, so we don't have um, formal data on um, these vaccines in pregnancy. Uh, so that's a problem. The flip side to that and where it's a problem is that we now know um, several months, almost a year into this, that pregnancy in of itself is somewhat a risk factor for more complicated disease or COVID. So if we look at sort of larger epidemiologic studies and you take women who are pregnant and compare that who have gotten COVID and compare them to women who are not pregnant, who are of the same age, we certainly see that those women who are pregnant are more likely to get admitted to the ICU, are more likely to get intubated, are more likely to be delivered or early or to deliver early. Um, and so that's, that's important. So we know that we have sort of a higher risk group of patients, but we don't actually have data. And so solid data to, to go on. So what, what we'd have to think about or is sort of draw some conclusions based on other things. Um, one, in those trials, Moderna and Pfizer, even though pregnant women were not actively recruited, certainly some women did become pregnant during the trials. 
So in fact, there was about 35 women total who became pregnant, about half were in placebo groups, half were in the um, vaccine groups. And at least at the time that data was presented to the FDA in December, et cetera, we did not see um, any increased risk of problems with those pregnancies, no increased risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, et cetera. Now, of course, at least we can presume that the majority of those pregnancies are still ongoing at this point. So that's, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what's, what's published there. Um, secondly, whenever we do, or not whenever, but often when there is a clinical trial that is done, one of the very first steps before it ever touches a human is to do some animal work. And I don't know if you guys have talked about DART studies at all in here, but what that stands for is developmental and, and reproductive toxicity, essentially, studies. And really what it is is it's animal trials before it ever goes to a human to look at safety regarding reproduction. And albeit humans are not rodents, um, but what those trials look, showed, at least for Moderna, I've not personally seen the Pfizer data, I think it's not out yet, is that there was really no increased risk of problems in animals. So take it with a grain of salt, but that was somewhat reassuring. Now, the third thing is that when we talk about the mechanism of action, which I know you guys have talked about um, with an mRNA vaccine, really what we're doing is sending the body just a quick message that, and that message is very quickly degraded and um, to create this spike protein. Now, I'm, I'm gonna talk about a spike protein here again in a second when we talk about infertility concerns, but, that there is really no plausible physiologic way that that mRNA or that message that we're delivering to your body can get to the fetus, crosses the placenta, doesn't enter your DNA, doesn't give you the virus. There is really no sort of concern when we just sit down and think about how this vaccine works as its potential to cause harm in pregnancy. The last thing I'll say is that certainly many, many, in fact, in registries right now, there's about 15,000 pregnant women who have received the vaccine, including many healthcare workers. And um, we have not seen at this point yet any concerns um, with pregnancy in getting the vaccine. So that's, that's sort of the background there. Um, we have been reassured enough at this point and know that COVID is significant enough in pregnancy that all of our national overseeing bodies, CDC, FDA, ACOG that was mentioned earlier, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, the Academy for Breastfeeding Medicine have all endorsed pregnant women or women who want to get pregnant or women who are breastfeeding getting the vaccine if they want it. So that's pregnancy. Um, now, infertility. It's a hot button topic. And that, and I will, it was sort of mentioned before, I, it is so much easier to spread inaccuracies and misinformation um, these days um, compared to real science science takes time. And so in that, it takes about two seconds to see something alarming on Facebook and take a screenshot and share it to people. And so this concern about infertility has spread like wildfire. And it's very hard to counter that. So the biggest concern about infertility is that spike protein that your body is being told to create an antibody to. I see the time. Um, is we have very similar proteins in our in human placenta. Okay, not it's not quite the same as a spike protein, but genetically it is somewhat similar in that it shares just a small um, what we call base pair or amino acid base pair with the spike protein. So somebody along the way noticed that and got very concerned that if your body has antibodies to this uh, spike protein, that you will also create an antibody response to the placenta and will thereby have miscarriage, stillbirth, et cetera. 
we have not seen that. So first of all, women, the proof is in the disease itself, right? So with COVID-19, we have not seen an increased rate of miscarriage or stillbirth, um, which would really be the biggest concerns there. Secondly, that genetic material that those two, that protein in the placenta and the spike protein share is minute and it is not enough to, for those antibodies to cross react really is what it comes down to. So we have simply not seen um, an increased risk of miscarriage or stillbirth um, with it. I could go, well, we're out of time, you. so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just to, uh, to conclude here, um, the vaccines are one of the keys, probably the most important key to uh, escaping all of the ill effects that we've experienced over the last year. Uh, they were, they, uh, it was a really an incredible scientific breakthrough uh, to have so far three and probably more vaccines that are gonna be incredibly effective. Uh, that's going to help us massively blunt the, uh, the health, economic and psychological consequences of everything we've had to deal with over the last uh, year. I would uh, encourage everyone uh, to uh, really strongly consider getting the vaccine if you haven't gotten it. Uh, we really probably need to get to um, a rate of around 70% or more of the population uh, getting the vaccine in order to achieve what's called herd immunity. Uh, that's going to be somewhat more difficult because of the viral variants. Uh, but remember, the vaccine is not only protecting yourself, but it's protecting your patients and it's protecting your relatives, your grandparents, your parents, your aunts and uncles. So uh, really strongly consider uh, all of these issues here. I think they're remarkably safe and remarkably effective. Does anyone else have any comments? Thank you for your time. I mean, remember to keep we're trying to present what we can, uh, you know, our own personal experience dealing with this illness over the past year. I'm sure there's gonna be a paper or two that's published, you know, uh, right now there's probably 30,000 papers out there, if not more, and somebody can always pull up. A, if you've got a paper that is just earth shattering and you share it with me, I would like to know because I, I cannot read 30,000 papers. I try to keep up with uh, the information. We, we in, in terms of groups, discussion, we talk uh, as a group together with amongst ourselves, amongst the universities, and even you know, going across the systems. People, you know, we all know people at different universities, Cleveland Clinic, UCLA. I mean, across the whole country, we're trying to pool our information together to come up with um, the best way to treat uh, patients and the best way to prevent illness. If you have something, share it. I mean, I don't want to contribute to the misinformation. And if there's something that is a, that's a breakthrough, would love to know more. Uh, so always can learn, learn more. Uh, appreciate everybody's time. And if you have uh, other questions, you can get them to Margaret Kramer um, at Baptist or uh, Dr. Doherty. <laughs> And uh, actually, uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to try to do another comprehensive educational update uh, to celebrate the anniversary of the pandemic. So that'll be uh, later this month sometime. Thank you. We could, if you want. One question that I don't think was completely answered that, that was asked. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I think they're going to ask for the emergency use authorization this week. It usually takes two to three weeks uh, for the FDA to approve it. I don't see any reason that they wouldn't approve it. And so we're thinking that that's going to be approved for use uh, at the end of the month or the beginning of March. On that same topic, we have a question. If people are allergic to the flu vaccine, will they be able to take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Yes, most of the allergies for the flu uh, with the flu vaccine have been related to egg allergies, uh, and there's no reason that they couldn't take the uh, the COVID nineteen vaccines. What if no one told you not to pre medicate and you took a leave? Is there any information on if you got protection from the vaccine? No. No information on that. <laughs> That's a simple answer. <laughs> I mean that that whole concept of uh, 
not taking, and they actually say both, they don't want you to pre-medicate with ibuprofen or acetaminophen, mm -hmm. is that you potentially could blunt the, what you're trying to get is your body to react, have an immune response to an, uh, the foreign antigen, and that you might blunt that response. That's been seen in other vaccinations. It's not been discussed for COVID vaccination. And the likelihood is it's still a small percentage. I wouldn't worry about it, but typically we're saying don't do it. If you need to take it afterwards, it's fine, but taking it beforehand, try not to. Don't do that. In regards to having to wear a mask after receiving the vaccine, including both doses, one must do so to prevent the possibility, possibility of spreading to others. Can you explain that please, since it's not the case for other vaccines? Okay, well, uh, with, with the COVID vaccines, we know that people even after they're vaccinated can potentially get infected. We talked about this earlier, uh, and we've certainly seen that happen. So you can get infected, your body responds to the infection and knocks it out probably uh, much more quickly than you would otherwise. We know definitely people don't get nearly as ill after they have the full effect of the vaccine. Uh, but that does mean that you can potentially spread it to others. And then another thing that's been thrown into the equation here uh, the, the last couple of weeks is the variants. And we know that the viral variants um, uh, well, in the case of the South African variant, basically what happened with the spike protein is it kind of uh, is uh, looks like almost a tulip uh, when uh, with the Wuhan variant, uh, with the South African variant, that tulip is basically opened up and it attaches to the ACE receptor, the ACE2 receptor in the respiratory tract more readily. So there are going to be more viral variants. There are more that we just don't know about right now. We don't even know how common these are in the United States because uh, we're just doing, uh, getting geared up to do um, uh, surveillance, uh, sequencing with surveillance and uh, to detect the, the uh, variants. So the vaccines are probably, we know that they're less effective against these viral variants. There are gonna be more that come along that may be even less effective. Uh, so that's, that's going, it's going to be a bit of a moving target. So you could potentially get one of these variants and potentially, potentially get sick from it. We don't, we don't have all the information. We think that they're going to be effective so far, but that does mean that you could potentially spread it to others or even potentially get ill yourself. It's, it's not a government conspiracy because that's part of on the internet. That's a part of the government's conspiracy. They're going to keep on moving the goalposts and then we'll just never, and they'll shut everything down and then, you know, and I'll lose even more hair. But um, well, this is what happens when this you have what, massive so, but amounts the, but of virus. But it's a great, quite, but it's, but it's a great question. It's a yeah. great question because we typically think of vaccines as always a, a preventative measure and that's a magic bullet. But remember, we're still in the very beginnings of having effective vaccines with a new illness. And it may be that down the line, we learn more and, and can say with more certainty that if you're vaccinated with XYZ, we can show enough of a protective effect to relax some of these other public health measures. But for right now, we're still using this, social distancing, you know, hand hygiene as measures while we get vaccinated, while we protect ourselves from more serious disease. You can say, for example, there are some data saying, although you can transmit and be asymptomatic, you probably transmit less effectively. And it makes some common sense than if you're coughing up you know, gobs of stuff into the air and you're more symptomatic and more ill, you know, your viral load might be higher, you might be coughing up, you might be more contagious. So that is data to be examined and that will be examined over the next uh, couple of years. And we know uh, that what happens with the immune system over time is that the, the antibody levels tend to wane. And uh, we know, for instance, with uh, natural infection with COVID-19, uh, that many people lose their antibodies after three months. Now there's still the other arm of the immune system, the T cell arm with memory cells that get reactivated as you get exposed. But while, they're, while that's getting geared up and uh, getting geared up for the fight against COVID-19, you can still get infected with the virus and then the immune system responds over the course of a few days. One other thing really quickly, because I know this is another internet thing. They talked about antibody uh, disease enhancement which people say, well, if you get vaccinated, you potentially could make things worse. And that's a big, uh, another thing that's circulating you know, besides the fertility and all the other stuff. And the, the answer to that is, and the, what they use is, remember I said that there were other vaccines previous to this in terms of SARS-1, where in animal models, actually some of those animals did worse when they got vaccinated. And it turns out all these vaccines are not the same. 
And they really have been more specific, very painstakingly looking at which components of the virus to elicit which kind of antibody response to come to these current vaccines, where to date there is no antibody enhancement. And in terms of uh, regular illness, SARS illness, if you get sick with SARS, there doesn't seem to be any anti- uh, signal that there's an antibody enhancement if you get sick the second time. There are some viral illnesses such as dengue that have a second infection. You're primed with the first infection. The second time you get sick, you can get extremely sick because you're primed with these antibodies. That is not happening with SARS. There are many different reasons. Part of it, there's different, in, uh, different cells that get infected with dengue than SARS. But at any rate, there's no vaccine enhancement of disease uh, to date. And it's being looked at, looked for. What's another question? Any data on how long the two doses of the vaccine will last before you need them again? No. No, we don't know that yet. I mean, they've been looked at at up to uh, over 120 days down the line. They've been looking at the, and there's vaccine response. The vaccine response to date is higher than the than, than the titers that you get with normal infection. So we know that in general, the, the vaccine titers are getting out of people is higher serologic response than with, with natural infection. But the duration is, is going to be studied over time. The, the trials are lasting for two years, so we'll know the answer to that. But uh, one of the things that we, that we've, that's been implied in our conversation here is, you know, if you've had COVID-19 uh, natural infection, the immunity doesn't last. So it lasts for at least three months probably in most cases, more like five to six months. Uh, but even if you've had it, you still need to get a vaccine. Last question. Do you know of a timeline when the public ages 60 and up can get the vaccine? It's coming soon. Uh, especially with the advent of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine on top of increased production uh, with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. So it will be soon. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All. Mm-hmm.